Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar Reyes Academy. Displayed are the list of news articles selected for today's analysis along with their page numbers in different editions of the newspaper. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the timestamping of the discussed articles is provided in the description box and for the benefit of mobile viewers it is also provided in the comment section. Now let's move on to the analysis of first news article. Recently we have been seeing some important art forms of outstanding significance and we have been seeing some important cultural festivals as well say for example Nagoba Jatra, Samakka Sarama Jatra in Telangana. On 14th February we saw about Konark Sun Temple, the facts surrounding its architecture. Then on 11th February we saw about Kila Rai Pitora which is a historic historical city in Delhi built by Prithviraj Chauhan. And that day in our practice questions discussion, we also saw that while Agra Fort, Red Fort Complex, Kudup Minar and its monuments, Fatehpur Sikri, while these sites are world heritage sites, Kilarai Pitora is not a UNESCO world heritage site. Now this news article here, it is with reference to a famous stone chariot inside the Vitala temple complex in Hampi. See Hampi is a city of historical importance in the state of Karnataka and Vitala temple complex in Hampi is a part of UNESCO World Heritage Site. In this context, we will discuss in brief about Hampi and some of the important structures in Hampi in Karnataka. The syllabus relevant for the analysis has been highlighted here for your reference. See, Hampi is an ancient city in Ballari district in Karnataka. Hampi is situated on the bank of Tungabhadra river. It was the capital city of Vijayanagara rulers. See this Vijayanagara is said to be the last great Hindu kingdom that ruled South India from 14th to 16th century. As we know this empire was established by Harihara and Bukka with the ideas of great saint patriot Vidyaranya. Harihara is the first ruler and this Hampi is very important because it has more than 1600 surviving remnants like forts, sacred complexes, royal complexes, riverside features, temples, shrines, halls, water structures etc. Some of the important structures are Krishna temple complex, Narshima and Ganesha group of temples, Lotus Mahal temple complex, other temple complexes and one among them is Vitala temple complex. And some of the remains that are unearthed from the sites of Hampi actually reveal the economic prosperity and the development that was once there in Hampi. The constructions carried out by rulers of Vijayanagara Empire exhibit Dravidian architecture. So it indicates Dravidian architecture flourished during Vijayanagara Empire. The architecture by Vijayanagara rulers are actually characterized by massive dimensions and there is also presence of secluded areas in monastery called as cloistered enclosures. Then there are also tall towers or lofty towers in the entrances and the pillars there were actually decorated. And one important fact with respect to Vijayanagara architecture is that it has adopted some of the elements of Indo-Islamic architecture. This style we can see in secular buildings like Queen's Bath, elephant stables, which are nothing but shelter for royal elephants. And the adoption of Indo-Islamic architecture elements indicate that Hampi was a multi-religious and multi-ethnic society. Now this information is important. If you see one mains examination in GS1 in 2014, it said that it asked the students to explain how Gandhara sculpture owed as much to the Romans as to the Greeks. So this information is important in this context in GS paper 1. And with respect to the sites in Hampi of historical significance, Battle of Talikota in 1565 AD is important. And this battle was between Vijayanagara Empire and an alliance of Deccan Sultanate. And in this battle, Vijayanagara rulers lost. And this is a reason for the decline of Vijayanagara Kingdom. And because of various sites in Hampi in Karnataka, UNESCO in 1986 have selected a set of monuments in Hampi and called them as Group of Monuments in Hampi and has included in the UNESCO World Heritage Site list. And one among them is Vitala Temple Complex, which is dedicated to Vitala, meaning an incarnation of Lord Vishnu. And it is one of the largest and most famous monuments in Hampi, known for extraordinary architecture, craftsmanship, and it also represents the expertise of Vijayanagara architecture. This temple is said to have been built in 15th century, when King Devaraya II was the ruler. Later in 1509 to 1529, many sections of the temple 
temple were expanded and renovated by Krishna Devaraya. And we can see some important structures associated with Vitala temple. They are uh, Kalyana Mantaba, Utsava Mantaba, large Gopuras at the entrance. And one most important thing is about the famous stone chariot. This chariot is actually a shrine which is dedicated to the carrier of Lord Vishnu who is called as Garuda. So this is about this news and the news article is stating that Archaeological Survey of India is planning to install a wooden barricade around this stone chariot to protect it from vandalism. So these are some of the important information with reference to Vitala Temple Complex and its connection with uh, the UNESCO World Heritage List. It comes under the cultural category. And now let's move on to the analysis of next news article. This editorial article is with reference to the Personal Data Protection Bill 2019 that was introduced in Lok Sabha. And we know that the bill was referred to a joint parliamentary committee that is presently conducting the process of public consultation. In this context, the author talks about data localization in particular. So we'll first see what do we mean by data localization and then the editorial. The syllabus relevant for the analysis has been highlighted here for your reference. See when we say data localization, the term data, it refers to personal data that is collected by any data fiduciary or any entity for that matter. Say for example, Facebook, Google, etc. Localization refers to storing these personal data locally that is within our country. So generally the term data localization it refers to various legal requirements for the physical storage of data within a country's national boundaries. However, we should also know that sometimes this term is also used to refer various restrictions that are placed for the transfer of data across the borders as well. So with reference to data protection, right now we do not have a specific legislation for this matter. However, know that for payment systems, a mandatory rule on data localization is there which has been given by Reserve Bank of India. And with reference to RBI's directives on storage of payment system data, last year they have asked a prelims question. Also in the editorial, you can also find general data protection regulation of European Union. In last year, they have openly asked this question that who have adopted a law on data protection and privacy called as general data protection regulation. So with reference to bringing a comprehensive legislation in our country, the government has earlier constituted a committee under the chairmanship of Justice Sri Krishna. This committee was constituted by Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology in 2017 and the committee has submitted its recommendations along with the draft bill in July 2018. And based on this committee's report, a mains question in GS3 was asked in the year 2018. So well, that was in 2018. Maybe in the coming years, we may expect a question on this bill and how this bill is in comparison with the draft suggested by the Sri Krishna committee or what are the issues and concerns in this bill. Like that, they may ask a question. In 2018, the government has released the draft bill suggested by the committee for public comments and they have inculcated few provisions. They have brought in some changes and they have introduced a bill in the Lok Sabha that is not as exactly as suggested by the Sri Krishna committee. So when we say 2018 draft bill, it refers to the draft bill suggested by Sri Krishna committee. And when we say 2019 bill, it refers to the bill that was introduced in Lok Sabha with some changes made to the draft suggested by Sri Krishna committee. Now, the main reason why we are saying about this 2018 draft and 2019 bill is because the committee's recommended bill, it imposed more stringent measures with respect to data protection. And according to draft 2018 bill, only personal data other than sensitive personal data may be transferred outside the territory of India. And if you see the introduced bill in Lok Sabha, it states subject to certain conditions, even the sensitive personal data may be transferred outside India. The 2019 bill also states that the critical personal data shall only be processed in India. Here the term critical personal data, it refers to personal data that may be notified by central government to be critical personal data. And note that the 2019 bill also states that subject to certain conditions, any critical personal data may also be transferred outside India. Here one reason for transferring of critical personal data is for emergency services or with respect to provision of health services or because of some reasons which in the opinion of central government the transfer of data will not prejudicially affect the security and strategic interest of India. But know that the 2019 bill does not define what is critical personal data and it states sensitive personal data could be transferred outside the territory of India. 
Now, if you see sensitive personal data, it includes financial data, health data, sex life of an individual, sexual orientation of an individual, biometric data, genetic data, transgender status, intersex status, caste or tribe, religious affiliation or even the political belief of a person. So even these data can be transferred according to 2019 bill. Whereas if you see 2018 draft, it suggested very stringent provisions with respect to sensitive personal data. And the 2019 bill is mainly criticized on three grounds. One is on the exceptions that are created for the government. Then with respect to limited checks that is imposed on surveillance by the government. And then there are certain deficiencies with the structures and processes with respect to data protection authority that is proposed by this bill. And know that it shall be the duty of this data protection authority of India to protect the interests of individuals or data principles, to prevent any misuse of personal data and to ensure compliance of the provisions of this bill once it becomes an act and then to promote awareness about data protection. It also has other important functions that are mentioned in section 49 subsection 2 of this personal data protection bill. Other than these three things, one of the most important concerns or contentious issues is data localization. We saw the dilution in the 2019 bill with respect to the draft suggested by Sri Krishna committee. So when the 2019 bill becomes an act, say for example in the present form, subject to certain conditions both critical personal data and sensitive personal data may be transferred outside India so in this context the author actually put forward arguments to advance the purpose of imposing stringent data localization norms one is from the perspective of sovereignty and government functions where by data localization it will enable to recognize Indian data as a resource that can be used to strengthen or further the national interest in two dimensions it could be economic dimension or in the strategic dimension and this will also enable enforcement of Indian law and functions of the government. The second argument is with respect to economic dimension that is associated with data localization. When data localization happens, the author's opinion is that this will have economic benefits to domestic industries or local industry whereby employment will be created at the local level or within India. And the third argument is protection of civil liberties. Say for example, privacy and protection of data. The argument is that local hosting of data will enhance privacy and security of data as Indian law will apply on the data and because of local hosting of data local remedy will also be available if a person is affected he or she can easily file a complaint by visiting the local office in other cases say for example data is stored in an international messaging platform which does not has a physical office in India it will be extremely difficult for seeking or accessing remedy now there is one more argument for localization that is when data is localized it also enables better exercise of privacy rights by Indian citizens particularly against any form of unauthorized access to data and this also includes even access of data by foreign intelligence agencies or even foreign private intelligence agencies for that matter and recently we heard a news that foreign intelligence agency particularly from the state of Israel the NSO group has attacked a lot of mobile devices of Indian journalists members of civil society organizations by launching a spyware called as Pegasus then the author states that the changes that were made in the 2019 draft bill reflect a more proportionate approach as it seeks to implement a tired system of cross-border data transfer. Here the data transfer will be based on sensitivity or vulnerability of data. We saw the classifications of sensitive personal data, critical personal data etc other clearly states that this seems to be in consonance or in accord with Supreme Court's judgment in Justice Puttaswamy case law in 2017. However, on closer examination, it appears that this 2019 bill may not actually stand the test of proportionality. This is because there are two main concerns. One is that the conditions that are given in section 34, which are the conditions for transfer of sensitive personal data, these conditions appears to be wider in nature and they are not narrow. And another concern is that while this bill requires consent of an individual with respect to collection or processing of personal data, the consent is not with respect to where his or her data should be stored. That is the individual has no right to say that his or her data should remain in India or may transfer to other jurisdictions. 
This is because if you see section 7 of the bill under class 1H, it states that for the purpose of collection and processing of personal data, the individual will be only given the information about any cross-border transfer of personal data if to be carried out. Based on this information, the individual can give consent or not, but he or she has no control whether it should be stored only in India or may involve cross-border transfer. And the author suggests that the bill should have an apt data protection regime. And this protection regime has to be effective where the security of data is to be determined by efficient technical measures, skills and cyber security protocols rather than just giving focus on the location of data. So these are some of the concerns with this bill that is introduced in Lok Sabha. Now the joint parliamentary committee is yet to submit its report and the author suggests that this committee which is currently examining this bill must conduct a more in-depth evaluation of localization provisions in the law and he also suggests the committee to include reforming surveillance related laws entering into more detailed and up-to-date mutual legal assistance treaties between India and other countries and also to enable the development of required sufficient state-of-the-art digital infrastructure and also about creating appropriate data sharing policies that preserves privacy at the same time enabling the data to be used for socially useful purposes. So with this we come to the end of the analysis of this editorial article. We saw some concerns with reference to this 2019 press personal data protection bill and on February 17 we also saw another provision with reference to this bill of 2019 with reference to significant data fiduciaries which are social media intermediaries when their user base crosses a certain threshold and when their actions are likely to have an impact on electoral democracy as per section 26.4 of this bill. And we also saw that such significant data fiduciaries should also have to undertake a data protection impact assessment. These things we discussed with reference to political micro target. Now let's move on to analysis of next news article. This news article mentions that an exhibition was held in Kolkata by National Council of Science Museums. Know that this National Council of Science Museums, it is an autonomous body coming under Ministry of Culture. It was established or registered as a society on April 4, 1978. Its main aim is to popularize science among the masses. So it portrays the growth of science and technology and their applications in industry and also in human welfare so as to generate or develop scientific attitude and scientific temper among the people. It also collects, restores and preserves important historical objects and these are objects that represent landmarks in the development of science, technology and industry. And among other objectives, it also establishes centers for the development of science exhibits and demonstration aids. And right now it is said that it is having around some 27 science centers across the country to carry out the objectives of this council. And in the recent exhibition in Kolkata, this National Council of Science Museums has exhibited over some 15 rare artifacts. One of them is George Newman disc recording machine which was used by Nobel laureate Rabindranath Tagore in 1932 to record some of his poems and songs. So in the context of analyzing this news article, today we will discuss about the great poet Rabindranath Tagore, his education, inspirations, his literary works and also how he contributed to the freedom movement in India. You should know that with reference to history, recently we saw about Cripps mission, cabinet mission plan and also the reasons why Indian National Congress that spearheaded Indian freedom struggle agreed for partition. We discussed about these things while analyzing an editorial on 20th February. And in your syllabus under GS paper 1, you can find the freedom struggle, its various stages, important contributors or contributions from different parts of the country. So this discussion pertaining to Nobel laureate Rabindranath Tagore will be important in prelim and in this context in mains. As we know, Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore was a poet, novelist, short story writer and dramatist. He was born on 7th May 1861 to Debendranath Tagore and Sarada Devi in Calcutta. And 1861 falls in a period when Bengal was hit by strong social, literary and cultural movements. And this period is also a period of religious reformation which was earlier led by Raja Ram Mohan Rai and few other important social reformers. As a result, the period itself had a great impact over the personality of Tagore and Tagore has penned his first poetry even when he was 8 year old. His first substantial poems under the title Banushima was released when he was 16. In 1877, he wrote Bikharani, which is a short story. 1882, he wrote Sandhya Sangeet, which is a collection of poems. 
his works are mainly in bengali language and through his works he denounced the british raj government and also advocated independence from the colonial rule his education began in brighton in london at a public school he was sent to england in 1878 his father wanted him to become a barrister or lawyer however it is noted in historical books that tagore had no interest in formal education such as what way he was learnt what way he was put in such as how he learnt in the school in london and therefore he showed no interest in learning in london and he was also later enrolled in university college in london again he was asked to learn law however he dropped out from that college and learned several literary works particularly shakespeare on his own and according to tagore a curriculum particularly an education curriculum it should revolve organically around nature where classes have to be held under open air for example say under the trees so as to provide a spontaneous appreciation of fluidity of plant and animal kingdoms and also seasonal changes and he is of the opinion that creative learning could be encouraged only within a natural environment so for this purpose he set up an open air school in a rural setting 100 kilometers away from calcutta and this place he saw it as an abode of peace also called as shanti niketan so that children while living in harmony with nature could cultivate natural creativity and in this abode of peace upanishadic goals of training were taught and classes were held under trees and uh, guru shishya method of teaching was followed and here we can take a note that mahatma gandhi and rabindranath tagore are two important historical figures in india who reacted against western education particularly for some reasons it is at the time when some indians strongly urged or advocated western education to set strong foundation in our country the reason why mahatma gandhi opposed western education is mainly because the colony education at that point of time sought to create a sense of inferiority in the minds of indians through education it made them to see that western civilization is superior it is one reason why mahatma gandhi opposed the western education now coming to rabindranath tagore he wanted to combine some elements of modern western civilization or education which he saw as best along with indian education or indian tradition for example he wanted to teach science and technology at shanti niketan along with art music music and dance and in 1951 this shanti niketan has got the status of a university now not only rabindranath tagore some of his family members are also important for the nation and also for our preparation see his father debendranath tagore was a religious reformer and an active leader in brahma samaj vijendranath who is his elder brother he was a poet and philosopher his another brother satyendranath tagore was the first indian to become a member of indian civil service he became a member through open competitive examinations that was held in London in 1864 his sister swarna kumari was a novelist and his nephew abhendranath tagore was the founder of modern bengal school of art now coming to tagore's literary works his inspirations were the literary works of ancient poets kabir ram prasad sen kabir was a poet in the 15th century whereas ram prasad sen was a poet in the 18th century we have given some of his famous novels short stories and his best works for your reference more importantly he is known as the only person who is credited to have written a national anthem for three countries see the song janagana mana it was originally composed in bengali language by rabindranath tagore later on 24 january 1950 the hindi version of this song was adopted by the constituent assembly as national anthem of india if you see the national anthem of bangladesh which is amar shona bangla it was also written by tagore and the national anthem of sri lanka is actually the translated version of one of his works in bengali translated by his student ananda samarakon into sinhala language and he was mainly influential in introducing indian culture to the west it was convenient for him as he was an admirer of both indian tradition and also modern western cultures and he is also regarded as outstanding creative artist of modern india he got international attention because of his work called geetanjali which is actually a collection of 103 english poems which are translated versions of his poems in bengali this work is said to have got international reputation in 1913 reports say that mainly because of geetanjali he has received 
the Nobel Prize for Literature. And he was the first Nobel laureate in Asia and also the first non-European to receive the Nobel Prize. Now let's see his contribution to the freedom movement. His role was significant with respect to the partition of Bengal in the period 1904 to 1911. In 1904, the Viceroy of India, Curzon, announced that Bengal province would be divided into two parts. At that time, Tagore wrote Swadeshi song called as Banglar Mati, Banglar Jal, called as Soil of Bengal and Water of Bengal. The song's objective is to unite the population in Hindu religious community and Islamic community. He also started Rakhi Utsav, where people from Hindu and Muslim communities, they tied colorful threads on each other's wrist. So in this way, he contributed to the fight against the partition of Bengal. And with respect to fighting for freedom, Tagore used his literature to mobilize political and social opinion and also reforms. And these are said to be reasons that other nations in the world to put international pressure on Britain to be accountable for its actions. As Tagore is known to have documented most of the things to expose Britain's true intentions in our country. Now, next important role is with reference to Jalin Bagh. This massacre happened in 1919. Earlier, Rabindranath Tagore has been conferred the title of knighthood in 1915. So, as a mark of protest on hearing the news about Jalin Bagh and the actions of Dyer, Tagore denounced the knighthood with a repudiation letter to Clemsport in 1919. Some few other important facts we can say the central government in Press Information Bureau it says that Tagore is the person who has first called Gandhi as Magatma and Tagore was called as Gurudev by the Mahatma. Mahatma has also addressed Tagore as the great sentinel and Rabindranath Tagore at the age of 80 years passed away in the year 1941. So these are some of the information with reference to Rabindranath Tagore, his early years, his education, his contribution to important stages in Indian freedom struggle. To commemorate his contribution, three Indian museums are dedicated to him and uh, two museums are dedicated to Tagore in Bangladesh. Now let's move on to the analysis of next news article. This news article is about intensified mission Indra Dhanush 2.0 in the health sector. So there is also an Indra Dhanush plan with respect to public sector banks about revamping PSBs through capital infusion. Well, that is in the sector of banking. This mission Indra Dhanush is with respect to health sector. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference. This news article states that the Union Health Minister has inaugurated a special campaign on intensified mission Indra Dhanus 2.0. So in the context of analysis, we'll discuss about history of immunization programs in brief about mission Indra Dhanush, intensified mission Indra Dhanus and also IMI 2.0. See, immunization program was introduced in India in 1978. It was introduced as expanded program of immunization under Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. After a period of seven years, the program was modified as Universal Immunization Campaign. It aimed to achieve immunization by covering all districts in the country by around 1989-1990. It was operational for so many years. However, it was able to fully immunize only to around 65% of children in the first year of their life. As a result, to strengthen and re-energize the immunization program, Government of India launched Mission Indra Dhanush in the year 2014. See, the ultimate goal of Mission Indra Dhanus is to ensure full immunization with all available vaccines. The target are children and pregnant women. When we say children here, children up to two years of age. And in order to have better outcome, government identified hundreds of high focus districts across states. And these are high focus districts that accounted for around 50% of total partially vaccinated or unvaccinated children in our country. Mission Indra Dhanus, it aimed to provide protection against particularly seven life-threatening diseases. They are diphtheria, whooping cough, tetanus, polio, tuberculosis, measles and hepatitis B. Under this program, in some selected districts, they also gave vaccination against Japanese encephalitis and Haemophilus influenza type B. And with respect to tetanus, vaccination was provided to pregnant women because it was found that newborns of unimmunized mothers were at high risk. And one of the important achievements after the mission Indra Dhanus is that the increase in full immunization coverage has increased. 
earlier it was around 1% every year but after the launch of this mission indra dhanus the increase reached up to 6.7% every year and in 2017 the government felt to further intensify the immunization program so intensified mission indra dhanus program was launched in 2017 here the focus have been those children and pregnant women who were not covered under routine immunization program or universal immunization program so it covered low performing areas in high priority districts and also in urban areas special attention was given to unserved pockets or low coverage pockets in urban slums with migratory population the focus was also on urban settlements and cities that are identified under national urban health mission which comes under the national health mission again to boost routine immunization coverage the government introduced intensified mission indra dhanush 2.0 last year here again it aimed to reach unreached population with all available vaccines and to accelerate the coverage of children and pregnant women particularly in the identified districts and blocks so it aims to achieve this from december 2019 to march 2020 so most probably we'll have the report card after march 2020 see the main ambition of this imi 2.0 is to achieve targets of full immunization coverage in 272 districts and this program is also meant to be implemented in block level in uttar pradesh and bihar as well in around some 652 blocks the program is also designed in such a way to give special focus to hard to reach population and also tribal populations So these initiatives will help India to achieve its targets with respect to preventing deaths of newborns and also to achieve SDG target 3.2 which states that countries should end preventable deaths of newborns and children who are below 5 years of age and this is to be achieved by 2030. And these are some of the salient features of intensified mission indra dhanush 2.0 most important among these salient features are enhanced focus on left outs dropouts and resistant families hard to reach areas and to give focus on urban underserved population and also in tribal areas so these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article we saw about history of immunization in brief and we saw about mission indra dhanush intensified mission indra dhanush then we finally saw intensified mission indra dhanush 2.0 launched last year now let's move on to the analysis of next news article this news article talks about decline in sex ratio at birth in the state of telangana and mentions some of the reasons behind the decline in this context we'll see about sex ratio child sex ratio sex ratio at birth and we'll see the national trend as per 2011 census and we'll also discuss in the context of telangana the syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference The news article mentions that sex ratio at birth in Telangana has shown a marginal decline in 12 months from Jan 2019 to Jan 2020. This is in comparison with the 12 month period from Jan 2018 to 2019. They are saying in 2018-19 the child sex ratio at birth was 957 it has declined to 950. While this is the information given in the news article we would like to present a fact about sex ratio at birth given by the annual report of telangana for the year 2018 2019 it states that sex ratio at birth in telangana is 881 so there is a question with reference to the given number so most probably that will be clarified or found answers later now let's come to what do you mean by sex ratio at birth see it refers to number of girl children who are born for every 1000 boy children born in a particular year According to census 2011 the sex ratio at birth at the national level was 909 which is not a good picture when we say child sex ratio it refers to sex ratio of the population in the age group of 0 to 6 years of age and as per census 2001 it was 927 and it had declined to 914 by the year 2011 and among the states and union territories the highest child sex ratio was reported by mizoram meghalaya and these states and with respect to lowest child sex ratio we have given a for your reference and note that child sex ratio which is for 0 to 6 years of age it is also influenced by the sex ratio at birth and death of children in the age of 0 to 6 years we should also know that sex ratio and child sex ratio while they vary between states they also vary between rural and urban areas see the national average for child sex ratio among rural population is 923 whereas for urban population it is 905 when we say sex ratio it is including females and males of 
all ages. Simply we can say number of females per thousand males in the population. In 2001 census it was 933 but it increased to 940 in 10 years which is reflected in census 2011. And Kerala is the state that has highest sex ratio of 1084 females per thousand males. And sex ratio in rural areas is at 949 whereas in urban areas they are just 929. And one of the reasons why in urban areas the sex ratio is lower could be mainly because of the reason that mostly to urban areas males migrate in comparison with women. However, this is one reason. So these are some of the information with reference to child sex ratio, sex ratio at birth and sex ratio. Now what is the reason for decline in the state of Telangana for sex ratio at birth? One of the reasons mentioned is feticide that is sex selective abortions in the womb of the mother. They are saying small families, they are preferring boy child. And also business community, they are also giving preference to male children. And the existing practice of dowry in the society is also another factor that causes the families to perform unlawful activity of sex selective abortion. And you should know that even though we have a legislation called as Dowry Prohibition Act of 1961, this menace is still haunting the lives of girls and women in the country. We have come to the last session, the practice questions discussion session. In this question, they are asking which of the above are bacterial diseases, diphtheria, whooping cough, tetanus, polio, tuberculosis, hepatitis B. If you know that hepatitis B is a viral infection, then you can easily arrive at the correct answer. Option B, 1, 2, 3 and 5. This is because polio, hepatitis B, they are viral infections. In fact, hepatitis A, hepatitis C are also viral infections only. So the correct answer is option B. Now this question is with reference to Rabindranath Tagur. They have given four statements asking which of the above statements are correct. First statement, Tagur was the first person in Asia who was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1913. Now this statement is correct. In fact, he was Asia's first Nobel laureate under any category to receive this international recognition. We'll come to the second statement. It states Santi Niketan, a learning center in natural setting, was established by him. This statement is also correct. This is because Rabindranath Tagore had a view that natural setting is an apt setting for creativity. So once you know that second statement is correct, you can eliminate option C. Now come to third statement. He renounced his knighthood as an act of protest during the Swadeshi movement. Now this statement is wrong. He renounced his knighthood as an act of protest for Jallianwala Bagh massacre. So third statement is incorrect. You can eliminate option D. The last statement, he was the first to call Gandhiji as the Mahatma. This statement is correct. So here we can find that only the third statement is wrong. So the correct answer is option B, 1, 2, 1, 4 only. Now this question is with reference to the architecture of Vijayanagara Empire. Two statements are given. They are asking which of the above statements are correct. First statement, structures built under Vijayanagara Empire reflect certain features of Indo-Islamic architecture. This statement is correct and the adoption of elements of Indo-Islamic architecture is visible in structures such as elephant's tables and queen's bath. So the first statement is correct. The second statement, the Vitala temple dedicated to Lord Shiva is famous for its stone chariot. Now here Vitala temple is famous for its stone chariot but it is dedicated to Lord Vishnu. This is because Vitala refers to an incarnation of Lord Vishnu from the Hindu mythology. And Virupaksha temple in Hampi in Karnataka is dedicated to Lord Shiva. In 2017 prelims, a question was asked with reference to Manipuri Sankirtana. The third statement of that question was, it is performed to narrate the life and deeds of Lord Krishna. So rarely these questions we may expect. The correct answer for this question is option A, one only. In this question they are asked which of the above are correctly matched. Sex ratio, number of females per thousand males. It is correct. Eliminate option B. Child sex ratio, number of girls per thousand boys in the age group of 0 to 6 years of age. Now this is also correct. So you can eliminate option A and option C. Third statement, sex ratio at birth, number of girls born for every thousand boys born. This statement is correct. So the correct answer is option D, 1, 2 and 3. 
So this is a mains question under GS paper 3. Protection of personal data is an essential facet of informational privacy. The Personal Data Protection Bill 2019, which was introduced in Lok Sabha, has been referred to Joint Parliamentary Committee for re-examination. Discuss the shortcomings of this bill with respect to the recommendations of Justice B. N. Sri Krishna Committee in relation to protection of personal data. You may write answer for this question and post the link of the uploaded PDF in the comment section so as to give feedback for your answer in a reasonable time. With this we come to the end of practice question discussion session and also the Hindu news analysis for today. If you like the video, click the like button, comment, share and subscribe to Shankarai's Academy YouTube channel for more updates and content on civil service exam preparation.